Welcome back and thanks for joining us for Two Steps Forward, our daily Bible study. I'm James and this is Aiden. We are up to episode 184 and Luke chapter 11. Um, anything you want to say before we get started here today? Um, I am excited. We ordered some new furniture so that we can set up like a recording space in our basement, which is, fin- uh, fi- we have a finished basement um, because... I am studying for boards, which I take in May, and then I take again in August. And so <laughs> I'm tired of moving all my note cards. Yeah. We don't just naturally have two chairs at, at one, one desk. desk. Yeah, we, we have to rearrange the house a little bit every time we do this, which is okay and uh, has worked really well up until now. But uh, again, appreciate uh, your support and studying with us and some uh, generous donations that allow us to update some space. So that we can have just a recording area. Yeah, so that will be nice. Yeah, that will be nice. So I look for that in the next probably couple don't, of weeks. Don't make promises. Yeah, I won't make. I shouldn't make promises. So soon, sometime soon. Uh, for right now, though, make sure to read through your copy of Luke 11 at home. And here is my personal summary. So Jesus begins by teaching on the issue of prayer, and we're told that one day he was praying, and his disciples requested to to teach them how to do it better. And Jesus said they should pray like this, and he essentially gives them what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer. The prayer addressed his Father in heaven, asked for spiritual blessings uh, that would glorify God, that would forgive us uh, for our sins, and that he would provide for all of our, our needs in life. And Jesus gave them an analogy. He said if one friend went to another friend's home and asked for Uh, loaves of bread to feed his company, even if it was late at night, he'd probably still share bread with him because of like the boldness of the request. The guy's coming at nighttime. um, He probably really needs this. And Jesus' point is that he wants us to boldly seek things from God and ask him. And um, he says it's sort of like a child coming to a loving father and asking for food. And he specifically says, now, a truly loving father, really any father, would not give a child a snake or a scorpion when they're asking for something nice. And his point is, if the heavenly father loves his children even more than earthly fathers love their children, of course, he's going to bless them with good things when they ask for it. We're told next that Jesus drove out a uh, a demon from a man that had caused the man to be mute for a long time. And finally, he was able to speak. And the crowd was really impressed by this. But some people accused Jesus of driving out the demon by satanic power. Uh, The power of Beelzebul is what they say. Others asked for an additional sign to validate that Jesus was doing this from God. Uh, Jesus understood what was going on in their minds and in their hearts, and he reasoned with them that it made absolutely no sense that Satan would be driving out demons by his own power. Uh, On the other hand, if this power isn't from Satan, they have to deal with the fact that he is truly from God. And Jesus gives this analogy about a strong man guarding a house to show, um, to illustrate that he's more powerful than the entire demonic realm. And whoever is not with Jesus is also against him. He also stated that sometimes a demon leaves a person for a time, and that person may clean up their life, but if they are not occupied by the Spirit of God, if they remain spiritually vacant, the demon will come back stronger with more demons than before. Now, that sounds really odd to us. We'll talk more about this in a second. Um, As Jesus taught, though, a woman from the crowd cried out that his mother was blessed to have birthed him. Um, Jesus' mother was blessed to have birth him. And Jesus replies by saying, blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Jesus then told the expanding crowd at this point that this generation was wicked and it always asks for signs. And it's not going to receive any sign except for the sign of Jonah. That is that Jesus will spend three days in the depths of darkness and death. And uh, prior wicked people like the Ninevites of Jonah's day will rise against these people, this generation, on Judgment Day and condemn them for having such little faith despite all the great evidence that's in front of their faces. Jesus offers the analogy then of our bodies being like lamps and he's the light inside of us when we look into his word and we should look to him and take no part in darkness. And finally, the chapter concludes by Jesus uh, finishing his teaching and a Pharisee invites Jesus over to over for dinner. And he noticed that Jesus didn't ceremonially wash before the meal. And Jesus said not to worry so much about ceremonial washing uh, and cleansing, but instead the Pharisees should feed the poor. And Jesus said that the Pharisees give a tithe on all sorts of items, 
but they don't show compassion and love to those who are genuinely in need. And he says it was right to do the former, but that they shouldn't have left the latter undone. We'll explain what that means. But Jesus said that the Pharisees are full of pride and love being the most important people in the synagogues and getting all the attention in the marketplaces. And he also said the experts in the law are actually in trouble because they overburden people with rules, but they don't offer to help themselves at all. Jesus said the Pharisees and experts in the law pretend to honor the prophets, but it was their legalistic ancestors who actually killed the prophets that were sent by God. And this generation would be held responsible for all of them. These supposed religious leaders have not actually become, uh, have now actually become hindrances uh, for people entering the kingdom. And as he left, the Pharisees and teachers of the law started trying that much harder to catch him saying something that was worthy of punishment. All right, now that's Luke chapter 11. Um, so, okay, I'm interested. This this is how your summary says it, and this is how I always heard or read this verse. Um, but it's a loving father wouldn't give... If a heavenly father loves his children more than earthly fathers, he will bless them with good things when they ask. Is yes. that what the verse says? So let us know which verse you're talking about specifically. Well, I don't know. It's a paraphrase. <laughs> Okay, well, you have to go to the... I know you I know you read Luke 11 already. Yeah, so. I did. Um, it is verse 13. Okay. How much more will you... So what does it actually say? It says, in my NIV 84, it says, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Yep, so that's what mine says. Um how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Yeah. I hadn't, when I read that, I'm like, I have never heard or thought of it that way before. That he's giving the Spirit, yes. not just earthly gifts. And it's, it's really interesting to me that your summary says good things because I always, always associate this with, um, like, he's going to give me earthly Prosperity blessings. Theology. So prosperity theology is so, I think the more I actually read and understand scripture, the more I realize how ingrained it was growing up in me and how, um, like how it taints certain things. So like, for example, um, my mom and mom, I'm not at all saying this, like condemning you. It's merely an observation. I'm not saying my mom's in generous. My parents aren't generous. They instilled in me the importance of a fr first fruit offering, a tithe. Like I tithed on my allowance as a kid. We'll talk about more about that in a second. A um, but I think that there was such an emphasis in our church growing up on God giving us earthly blessings mm -hmm. that I would say when my mom tells me something, she, a blessing that she received, nine times out of ten it's monetary. So yesterday she told me um, something, some squirrels ate some wires in her car, Northern Michigan, and it was going to cost thousands of dollars to fix. And her, she checked with her insurance company and they said, it's an act of nature, pay a hundred dollar deductible. Mm -hmm. And she's like, oh, it's such a blessing. I'm not saying it isn't a blessing. It yeah. is. But I, again, nine times out of 10, if she's reiterating a blessing to me, it's always something financial. And I think it's just that thought that was so heavy in our church in the 90s, and prosperity theology is obviously still around, but I think that's when it really exploded, that God is going to give you earthly blessings to the same degree you tithe or give offerings or pray for those blessings or believe you're going to receive those blessings, he's going to give you those earthly blessings. Mm -hmm. So never once had I ever read or heard this, that he's going to bless you with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what what does it mean then that he blesses you with the Holy Spirit? So that he would be giving you uh, everything that the Holy Spirit can provide you with. So right. resistance from temptation, the fruits of the Spirit. Sure. That like he's sending, he's giving you his Spirit. That's the best. That's the best blessing or gift that you can ever. Primarily receive. spiritual gifts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so even that. I, I guess what I would say is like to, to view it primarily as just good to view good things as earthly stuff mm -hmm. would be way too um, myopic. I, yeah, too shallow, too broad, too whatever. However, to say okay, he gives us the Holy Spirit. That means you have to you do have to unpack that. That's almost so specific. Like you have to say what does that mean? 
And it clearly is primarily in the spiritual realm. Right. And every good thing comes down from the Father of the Heavenly Lights. Every good thing is ultimately a gift of the Spirit. Yeah, I'm not saying those things aren't blessings. Right. So, yeah, I guess what, what I'm saying then is, so when Jesus just taught the Lord's Prayer... And something a lot of other people forget mm -hmm. is when he teaches the Lord's Prayer in the petitions, there's the one that is primarily about material things. Yeah. So even that itself <laughs> suggests Christians should be asking primarily for spiritual gifts, mm -hmm. but it's not wrong to ask for... I'm not physical. saying it's wrong. You're, you're not. I know, but I'm clarifying for people because yeah. you're coming at it kind of strong. <laughs> I'm coming at it... So I guess what I'm saying is I wish that... Um, growing up, I would have been taught to look more at all of the other blessings I receive versus just looking more for the monetary ones or expecting those or wanting those. Yes. The flesh will always shoot for the lowest common denominator and distort even things like prayers into mm -hmm. making my... It's easy. It, our prayer lives turn into about me mm -hmm. primarily a lot of the time. And that's why when Jesus says, this is how you should pray, it's not only the Lord's Prayer, but it's like a template. And notice he's like... Six out of the seven petitions are primarily spiritually focused. Mm -hmm. And if our prayer lives are, aren't that same kind of balance, then our prayer lives probably aren't reflecting how we should pray mm -hmm. sort of thing. And I think what you're saying is, and this is that's part of the, the evolution maturation of faith too. Like you growing up, it's partially, I mean, it, it might be what your church taught or what the world taught or what was going on in Christianity. It might also have been that you were primarily a child you know, at that time, mm -hmm. learning it. And that's how you associated good things. Mm -hmm. Whereas somebody could say the spirit gives good things, you know, here mm -hmm. and say like, yeah, the good things primarily are the spiritual gifting, the faithfulness and the resolve to resist temptation and the generosity and charity and patience with others and those mm -hmm. types of things, you know? Yeah. So it, I think it's worth clarifying. And I think this, that's what you're doing. Um, when he says, first of all, it's a good pickup that he doesn't just say good things in general. So our flesh shouldn't associate that with earthly blessings. Well, he primarily I, says the spirit. I have never heard it read that way. Yeah. Or taught that way. Yep. It, is it in a different gospel where it says good things instead of the Holy Spirit? So there is, um, I, I mean, the next thing that he says is ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds and he who, uh, whom and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. And then he, you know, it goes on to give some examples. And so there's an, uh, it doesn't say when you ask for this, it, there's no object in there. Uh -huh. So it seems to be more, what's being taught here is the persistence and the boldness with which you ask God, mm -hmm. not specifically what you ask him for. Yeah, I'm saying in a different gospel, it must actually use the words good things, because why else would we be saying good things instead mm -hmm. of saying Holy Spirit? Yeah. Like, where did that come from? Yeah, there, I mean, um, right, it, it might be in a, one of the other gospel mm -hmm. parallels. I, I'm off the top of my head. I can't remember what the other ones say. So maybe in Matthew's gospel, it does say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So devotional thoughts for the day then. Number one, uh, Jesus rebukes demons and bad logic. So we notice here that he's driving out a demon. Uh, this whole under the section of Jesus and Beelzebul. Uh, we're told that there's this guy who is has a demon ha has made him mute, which is it seems odd to us, obviously, in a variety of different ways. As 21st century people, we don't talk about demonic possession and stuff all that much. But somehow, uh, a demon has affected him in such a way that it stunted his ability to talk. Well, what does Jesus do? He drives out the demon. So he has this spiritual power over the spiritual realm. But then the next thing that he does is some of the Jewish leaders are criticizing him for the way that he drove out. And it's mm -hmm. like, where does he get this power? And some of them are asking for a sign from heaven to validate that this is uh, godly power, not demonic power. And others are just flat out accusing him and saying it's by the power of Beelzebul or Beelzebub, uh, which is essentially just a term for the pagans, uh, pagan worshipers of the ancient world that the Israelites commonly used at this time to describe any demonic power. Mm -hmm. And what Jesus does at this point is he doesn't offer him another miracle. What he does is he gives them a logical argument as to why that makes no sense. He says, mm -hmm. why would I, if I was working for Satan, why would I be driving out demons? Mm -hmm. That would be the house divided against itself cannot stand. That makes no sense. 
So I love the fact that Jesus is not just a mystic with supernatural power, nor is he just a pragmatist who's always making rationalistic arguments. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when he deals with the spirit realm, he is demonstrating supernatural power. And sometimes when he's dealing with people who are just being foolish, he just gives a good argument. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like the nuance of Jesus that people sometimes miss. He's not just a miracle worker and he's not merely a teacher. He's all of these things. And so, especially in Luke's gospel, where Luke is a doctor who uses technical terms, Mm -hmm. what we find is Jesus addresses spiritual problems spiritually, physical problems physically, Mm -hmm. and emotional and relational problems emotionally, psychologically, and relationally. And you just cannot pin him into one category or or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that he's like within the same breath and the same verse, he both drives out a demon and he drives down the bad logic of the people around him. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything to add to that? The, the question that I pose to you here is what, and I actually just answered it a couple minutes ago, but uh, I wanted to ask you and, and readers, what misperceptions of Jesus have you had that were later corrected? That he had blue eyes. <laughs> okay. That would be a, that would be a very literally superficial one. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like that whole thing about he's primarily here to give me. Yeah, to give me. Physical, physical gifts in this life not to I, one of the to ways to make my life easier right this is what one of the reasons what i've learned to pray and for whatever reason i know a lot of people have told me this registers with them i've and i often like force people to pray in front of me and that it helps me diagnose a little bit too but one of the things that i'll tell them is stop praying that all your problems would go away mm-hmm. start praying that god would make you big enough to face whatever problems might come in your life mm-hmm. Because not facing any problems, you'll never get stronger. Facing resistance in life, but having the resources to deal with that resistance can actually make your muscles stronger. Mm -hmm. So you got to flex those spiritual muscles. Don't pray. Don't look at Jesus as some divine assistant assistant who just makes life easy. Look at him as uh, a savior redeemer who also coaches you into the best possible version of yourself. Okay. Uh, devotional thought number two, then, is the power to change. Really interesting section here that starts in verses 24 to 26. Jesus gives a little bit of, so he gives two parables in here. He drives out the demons, he rebukes the logic, mm-hmm. and then he gives two parables involving, uh, the first one is involving a strong man of a house, which is actually, he's saying, if you're occupied by a Uh, evil power or sinister power. Satan has some kind of control over your life. Jesus is the one who overcomes the strong man who's trying to take hold of your life. But the second parable is, is one of a guy who has an occupying demon and he cleans up his life and he cleans up his house and it bounces back and forth between those two. He drives out the demon and it says, um, like he gets his house in order Mm -hmm. And the demon goes away and it says it travels through arid places and arid places are like lifeless, waterless, destructive. Satan's always looking for destruction, chaos. Mm -hmm. And this guy has gotten his life in order, but the demon comes back and he finds that the guy is still spiritually vacant. Mm -hmm. And he says, oh, there's opportunity here. And he invites other demons and the the demon comes back stronger than before. The the problems come back stronger than before. And what this is essentially teaching us, it's a fascinating concept. But I think what Jesus is teaching here in this parable is it's possible. There's multiple ways to get rid of problems in your life. You can clean up your act. You can clean up your life. You can overcome through willpower a number of problems. But you cannot overcome that problem and stay spiritually vacant without that problem coming back in a stronger form later on. When I was a kid, 10, 11, 12, um, I had this series of books that were fictional books, but they were about the supernatural. And one of them, there were like a group of kids that had to battle all these supernatural forces. And one of them was... um, about a girl who was demon possessed and they cast out the demon these are christian books and then they tell her at the end like you yes so your heart is now empty like the demon is gone but you have to invite the holy spirit to live there because if you don't yeah like why he would just come back right like so it doesn't seem strange to me at all i think that makes perfect sense if you think of yourself like a vessel like you can't you're going to be possessed by something because you by nature are this empty spiritual vessel Mm -hmm. you have to hold something you're built to hold something it's kind of like when we talk about worship you can't not worship something even if you consider yourself non-religious 
you're going to prioritize something as the ultimate apex most valuable thing in mm-hmm. your life. So you have to worship because you're created by God to be a worshiper. You're created by God to be a spiritual vessel. And so you're going to be possessed by something. It has to be, uh, if, if it's not Jesus Christ, it you know it could be some kind of demonic force, but it's something that's going to consume you. And an example of this, and so I guess maybe I'd ask you the question here. Um, can you think of any solutions? So the idea is, there's ways to solve problems mm-hmm. that usher in bigger problems. Mm-hmm. There's ways to drive out a demon that ushers in more demons. So can you think of an example? I have several, but I want to give you uh, a chance to like think like personally about it. Can you think of an example of a solution to a problem in your life that actually creates more problems down the road? Yeah, so I was chubby in high school and then... So was focused on like emotional eating, overeating, lost weight, and then was extremely focused on exercising calorie restriction to the point of like having to go to therapy. So it's literally just exchanging one. I'm obsessed with my body in either mm-hmm. in either whatever. So you might think that the problem was solved. Like I started working out, I lost this weight, I ate differently, but it was still so all consuming mm-hmm. that the problem was still there. Like the body image, the... Yes, right. So like, uh, I guess you could say, and I'm, I'm using the like religious words here, but gluttony and vanity. Gluttony is about me, mm-hmm. but you can overcome it through willpower, but it immediately, if you remain spiritually vacant in the process, if you don't invite Jesus into the process, it turns into vanity. Mm-hmm. We are still just as obsessed. Before you were obsessed with your probably comfort and now or feeling good, and now you're obsessed with looking good. Mm-hmm. But in either case, you're still obsessed with self. Yeah. And so that's that's a great example. Um, when, I, when I preached on this a while ago, the one I used was telling young men to... Um, to toughen up by don't be such a girl when you cry. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is what it does is it forces guys at a young age, you learn that in order to be a man, in order to develop and mature, you have to stuff all your emotions. And I don't think our culture is quite at this spot anymore. I don't think anyone says don't be a girl. Yeah, I was thinking this when don't you said. Don't be such a girl. Did someone say that to you? I feel like people would say don't be such a baby. People have said that. That's probably because of. Uh, that's extremely societal offensive shifts. to say. Uh, that's, you you didn't hear it because you were a girl. Well, guys say stuff like this all the time, hmm. and uh, I in fact I guarantee probably every guy has heard something to that effect in their youth. An adult said that to you. Yes. Um, and, and it was like just guys speak this way in the confines of other guys, like of coaches course, or something. Yes, of course they wouldn't say that. <laughs> of course they wouldn't say something like that to a girl, mm-hmm. right? Um, but it's, it's very clearly not only. I guess my dad told me to man up. Man, that's or, the fact that that's a phrase. Buck up. That's a phrase, right? Which is yeah. There are other phrases that I won't get into that are mm-hmm. socially accepted, but I would think totally inappropriate. That are like be more of a man on this, mm-hmm. and like number one, that's it's obviously kind of insulting to women. Number two, what it does is it forces guys to say, in order to be what I want to eventually become, so if I'm a boy and I want to become a man, it requires me to oppress my, repress my emotions. Mm-hmm. And so what you end up with is a lot of guys, and guys don't need extra encouragement to not be emotionally intuitive. But what you end up with, and the, exam- the statistics that I always give is men are, for instance, incarcerated at a rate of nine to one to mm-hmm. women. Why? Because they have this anger that is not processed and it explodes. Men also commit suicide at a rate of four or five to one to women. Why? Because they have this anger that implodes. So either way, they have these emotions that are non-processed, mm-hmm. that are exploding or imploding, but it's clearly not healthy. Why? And I'm not saying it's all because they were told to be girl, to not be girls when they're young. I'm saying because they weren't. You're trying to solve a moment of tears mm-hmm. by encouraging emotional repression, and that ends a short-term problem by creating a much bigger problem in the long run. Mm-hmm. It drives out a demon by inviting in more demons in the long run. And I think, like, so there's very obvious ways to do this. Uh, and I think the solution is... Unless you invite, you have to invite Jesus into the process of this. If it's uh, to not remain spiritually uh, vacuous and vac- vacant, mm-hmm. to, so that pro- any salt solution to a problem is one that is healthy and productive in the long run. Mm-hmm. Okay. Your solution should probably, whatever it is, start with repentance. Right. That's another way of looking at it. 
Um, yes, repentance, an understanding of my my self focus is hurting the world, mm-hmm. including myself. If I turn from myself and turn towards the grace of Jesus Christ, I'll find healing. Yeah, good. Repentance, repentance is the the place to start. is is probably the best word to use to describe positive solutions. Um, okay, third devotional thought. Then Jesus upholds the tithe. This would be one for me that was uh, maybe kind of alarming into my twenties. Um, so this is a, the section starts in verse thirty seven where Jesus announces woes and he's announcing his woes to the Pharisees. And it's actually a section a little bit surprising to a lot of Christians where he actually affirms the tithe. And uh, Christians, so the tithe is very clearly and specifically a ceremonial law for the Israelites of the Old Testament under the Mosaic Covenant, the first fruit offering, the first 10% tithe of what you received was to be given to God as an expression of one, gratitude for what he had provided in the harvest, and number two, expression of what he would continue to provide Mm -hmm. through your fields as well, okay? So the first tenth went to God in gratitude and in faith. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, when you get to the New Testament, we understand that Jesus is the fulfillment of the ceremonial laws. So the questions then remain, we find a lot of New Testament believers, whether in Hebrews or otherwise, but when they have converted out of Judaism into Christianity, to what extent do these old ceremonial laws play? So they have questions about the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. They have questions about the tithe. And what Jesus says here uh, to the Pharisees in their tithing, they were still tithing, and he says, you should have left the latter, uh, you should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. And in this particular instance, that's verse 42, the latter is the generosity to the poor and the needy. And the former is the sort of tithing that they were doing on everything that existed. Everything that came in, they were giving that tenth to God. Mm-hmm. But they ne- because they gave the tenth, they thought it wasn't their job to help take care of the poor and needy. Mm-hmm. Because they were giving their gift, they thought it left them off the hook of showing love to the people in their lives around them. And uh, I think the question then is, to what extent, not only do we see Jesus far from like... Um, ending the tithe here, he sort of affirms it Mm -hmm. for the Pharisees. And then what I think we have to ask ourselves is, okay, what role then does the tithe play in our lives moving forward? And I think the question, the way I heard it put once, is if a tithe was what God helped his people understand was Mm -hmm. an appropriate way to say thank you in the Old Testament for all the grace that God has shown to his people. In the New Testament, on the other side of the cross and empty tomb, have we received have we received more grace or less grace mm-hmm. than the Old Testament believers? And if the tithe was the way to say thanks in the Old Testament for God's grace, if we've received more grace in the New Testament, I, I think you have to say like it's 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 got to be some kind of like starting point for us, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm curious, did your parents or I mean, when we met, you seemed to not really believe in or understand or i mean i don't think you gave a tenth of whatever you were i did not do a tenth. no so did your parents never talk to you about this did your schooling never talk to you about it yeah um not in any kind of like real concrete way doesn't it seem strange for a lifetime of christian education yes <laughs> yeah there's no there's no way around it 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 was, I think one of the things that stood in the way was not just the awkwardness of talking about money, although I know that's a thing. Um, I think it was also the reality of the fact that, so like when you're being, when you're in education, you're dealing with young people Mm -hmm. who have no income or little income. Mm -hmm. And I think the thought, I think the thought, and it's a wrong thought, but I think it was the thought Mm -hmm. is that, okay, when you don't have any money, how much time and energy should you spend talking about the money that you give? Yeah. And that uh, giving programs was part of adult discipleship. And I I disagree with that, but Mm -hmm. I'm saying I think that was part of the logic. Yeah, you could really say that about anything, though. But if you don't teach your kids growing up that sex in any form outside of marriage is sinful, like, are you going to wait till they're 18 and, right, right, you know? Yep. Or money or anything. But, I mean, I do remember my grandma telling me, like, oh, no, you don't have to give whatever, 10% of your allowance. Like, you're a kid, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know there are different, like, understandings of it or applications of it for different ages. She said you did or you didn't? She said I didn't have to. Okay. So 
in my parents like instilled you give a tithe Mm -hmm. on your allowance on your income whatever and my grandma was like oh that's terrible she's just a kid like let her keep her allowance (laughs) yeah um so i think they i I like the idea honestly of parents if they're gonna do an allowance and we didn't really do that in my house but if you're gonna do an allowance or something like that Mm -hmm. a paycheck that parents would say okay let's sit down and talk about this money Mm -hmm. and here's in like this is the joshua thing as for me and my household we will serve the lord and here's what i want to teach you as an approach look at all god has done for us look Mm -hmm. at all he's given to us including this paycheck Mm -hmm. uh here here, we need to say thank you to him just like you teach your kid to say thank we don't think it's legalistic to say uh when you spend the night at another kid's house make sure to thank their parents Mm -hmm. you know when you leave that's not legalistic so why would it be legalistic to say okay look at what god has given us let's say thank you to him Mm -hmm. and i think that's an excellent learning opportunity kids definitely absorb the patterns and behaviors of their parents more than they do their classrooms or their uh, what even what they hear at church. Mm-hmm. So it primarily should come from parents. And um, yeah, I think that's all that's all fair. I, I, I would say that, um, you know, it wasn't until I probably got in my 20s that uh, I know you and I had some important conversations about this early on. Mm-hmm. And I was still in school at that time. And I think I always thought too that when I get to the point where I'm working, mm-hmm. then I'll figure it out. The problem, of course, with that is I've been blessed even before I'm working, so I have things that I can give. Mm -hmm. But secondly, there is no evidence that having more money makes you more generous. Mm -hmm. So like the idea of instilling those principles while you have very little to nothing is important. And that's the only way you can hit the ground running when you actually do get some kind of income. Yeah. All right. uh, Let's close the prayer then. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you have given us in this year we're, we're recording this right now uh during holy week and man when we think about even like a tithe how much grace have we received we're on the other side of the empty tomb we're on the other side of everything that you gave at the cross uh and we are just waiting to receive what you have earned for us eternally we have so much to be thankful for we have so many blessings to manage uh le- let the let the tithe and, and those kind of guidelines be a good guide, but uh, more than anything, let our hearts just overflow with uh, the generosity and gratitude that comes with you giving your whole life for us. Uh, and in that way, we know that we can glorify you and bless others. It's in your name we pray. Amen. And mom, if you think I'm being unfair to you, I apologize. You can call me and give yell. her a call. Call me and yell at me. <laughs> Not that my mom yells. <laughs> All right. Uh, well. Uh, God's blessings on the rest of your day. Thanks for studying with us. We will see you tomorrow for Luke chapter 12.